For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 3E. In this video, I will be looking at energy and stability in stars. I will look at internal energy, gravitational energy under Newtonian gravity, then we'll find the equilibrium binding energy, and we'll look at the criteria for stability. I rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. When we talk about the energy of a star, what we really mean is its binding energy. So what is binding energy? Let's say we have a star, and infinitely far away there is some small volume of mass at zero temperature. We define this configuration to have zero energy. So it has no gravitational potential energy, and it has no thermal energy because it's at zero temperature. This is obviously not a realistic configuration. It's a theoretical construct which we define to have zero energy. Now if we let this volume of mass fall into the star, it will pick up kinetic energy, trading off gravitational potential energy for that kinetic energy. And let's say it comes to sit at the surface of the star. It's lost all this infalling kinetic energy, which was either transferred into thermal energy, so now it has some finite temperature, or that energy was radiated away. So now the total energy of the star will be the internal energy plus the gravitational energy. The gravitational potential energy will be equal to the negative of the infalling kinetic energy right before this mass comes to a stop. The internal energy will be the fraction of that kinetic energy that is transferred to heating up the material. And the total energy will therefore be the energy that's lost due to radiation. So for a bound system, this energy will be negative, meaning that the negative of the kinetic energy, which is the gravitational potential energy, will be greater than the internal energy. So by this definition, what we're calling energy is the amount of energy you'd have to give this volume of mass to move it back to infinity at zero temperature. So now let's do the same thing, but for a dust cloud, which we're gonna say has almost zero energy initially. The dust cloud collapses, it heats up, and it forms a star. And in the process, it radiates away some energy. And this lost energy will be the energy you need to put into the star to blow it back out to infinity at zero temperature. So by this definition, if the energy is negative, then the star is bound. If it's positive, it's unbound, because you don't have to put any energy into it to blow it back out to infinity. Now let's calculate this binding energy. We have to find the internal energy and the gravitational potential energy. So let's say we have a star, and inside we have some small volume of mass, and it will have internal energy and gravitational potential energy. Let's first take a look at the internal energy, which we found already in Stellar Physics 2A. Just to remind you, if U is the internal energy, P is the pressure, V is the volume, T is the temperature, S is the entropy, N is the number of particles, and phi is the chemical potential for each particle. We're going to assume an adiabatic process. And so the change in energy will simply be negative PdV, which means there's no heat flow. Why are we doing this? Ultimately, we want to find stable configurations. And if you recall from Stellar Physics 1A, the first video in this series, instability occurs when the sound crossing time is of order the freefall time. And the speed of sound is determined by the adiabatic index. Basically, what we're asking here is how will the system react to perturbations in short time scales, i.e., before heat has time to flow? The volume is just the mass divided by the density, so I'm going to change variables and substitute the volume for the density. For an adiabatic process, the pressure has the following form, which we found in Stellar Physics 1A K is some function of entropy, and gamma 1 is the adiabatic index. We can now integrate this to get the following expression for the internal energy. This constant C we don't actually care about. It turns out to just be the rest mass. So it's just a constant offset, so we can subtract it off from our definition of energy. So this was the internal energy for our small little volume of mass. Now we have to add up the energy for every little piece of mass in the star, which means we just have to integrate over the mass of the star, which gives us the final form for the total internal energy of the star where rho naught is the central density, 
m is the total mass of the star, and a1 is some numerical factor that results from integrating this over some density profile. Just for good measure, k, remember, is a function of entropy, and the entropy might change at different points in the star, so in principle it may not be constant. But just like we did with the density, you can take k at the center of the star, and then the integral will result in a numerical factor that can be absorbed into this numerical factor a1. Now let's take a look at the gravitational energy. Newton's law gives us the form of the potential energy between two masses. Since we're in a spherically symmetric configuration, our little volume of mass will only feel the gravity from the mass enclosed. So we can substitute in the mass of our little volume and the mass enclosed into Newton's law to get a differential form for the gravitational potential energy. Now we again integrate this over some profile to get that the total gravitational potential energy will be proportional to the mass squared divided by the radius of the star, where b here is again a numerical factor that comes out from integrating over some profile. I'm now going to replace r by using the fact that the density is the mass divided by the volume to get that the total potential energy is proportional to the mass to the 5 thirds times the central density to the 1 third. And a2 again is some other numerical factor that will be determined by the density profile of the star. So for a given mass and a given central density, we now know the total binding energy of a star. The mass is not something that's going to change. It's fixed by the size of the cloud that collapsed into a star. We now have to find what is the central density for a given mass. And in order to do that, we're going to minimize the energy. If you're enjoying this video so far, please be sure to like and subscribe. And don't hesitate to share it with a few friends. So now let's find the equilibrium binding energy. We know what the form of the total energy is, and the only thing that can vary here is the central density. In order to find the equilibrium energy, we have to minimize with respect to the density, so that means taking a derivative and setting it to zero. So let's do that. Since these two terms must add up to zero at equilibrium, they must be equal to one another when the density is the equilibrium density. This gives us an expression for the equilibrium density in terms of the mass of the star. And so we now have found the equilibrium energy. So notice that if gamma 1 equals 4 thirds, which is the case for radiation dominated stars, the total energy of the star is zero. We'll take a closer look at this in a little bit. First, we have to make sure we've actually minimized this energy, because taking a derivative only gives you stationary points. So if we plot here the energy versus the density, or the central density, we could have a graph that looks like this, where the equilibrium point will be at the top of this curve. On the other hand, the curve could be upside down, and the equilibrium point will be at the bottom of the curve. In both cases, the derivative at this point is zero. However, in this first scenario, this is a maximum, and it is unstable. This is exactly like a ball at the top of a hill. The ball sits at the top of the hill, it's in equilibrium, it won't move, but if you displace it a little bit, it'll roll down the hill. The forces will pull it away from the equilibrium point. Whereas in this second scenario, we have a minimum, and this is a stable equilibrium point. So just like for a ball at the bottom of a gully, it will be sitting at an equilibrium point, but if you displace it a little bit, the forces on the ball will be restoring forces as they will pull the ball back down to the equilibrium point. So in order for the star to be at a stable equilibrium, we need to make sure the energy curve is concave up, meaning we need the second derivative to be greater than zero. So let's now find the criteria for stability. We have the energy of the star. We found the equilibrium energy. Now we have to set the second derivative at the equilibrium point to be greater than zero. We've already found the first derivative. So we just take another derivative. We evaluate this at the equilibrium point and set it to be greater than zero. And so we found that a star will be stable if gamma 1 minus 4 thirds is greater than zero. Recall that in stellar physics 2c we found what gamma 1 is, where beta is the fractional gas pressure, so it's the gas pressure divided by the total pressure, and little gamma is the adiabatic index for Maxwell-Boltzmann gas, so when beta equals 1. So if beta equals 1, Gamma 1 will equal little gamma. 
And if beta equals zero, which is for a 100% radiation pressure, gamma one is four thirds. And the star will have a total energy of zero and be on the brink of instability. This should make sense intuitively because an energy of zero means it takes zero energy to blow the star out to infinity. As I said, we're going to take a closer look at what happens if you have a radiation dominated star in a little bit. But first, I have to clarify something. This result is not actually correct. This only holds if gamma 1 is constant throughout the star. But that's not necessarily going to be true. A more in depth analysis will take in consideration variations in gamma 1. And when you do this, I'm not going to do it because it's a very long derivation, it turns out it's not gamma 1 that matters, but the pressure average of gamma 1, which I'm calling gamma 1 tilde. This volume integral can be rewritten in terms of a mass integral by substituting in the definition of gamma 1. If you're interested in seeing this derivation, you can find it in this book by Shapiro and Tukulski called Black Holes, White Dwarfs, and Neutron Stars. If you want to understand compact objects, I highly recommend this book. The derivation is found in chapter 6. And it's about 20 pages long, and it's a very difficult derivation. So you can understand why I'm not going to do it in this video. Instead, I'm just giving you the result. So this actually works out nicely, because even though our results were incorrect, we just have to replace all the gamma 1s with gamma 1 tildes instead. Okay, so what happens if you have a radiation-dominated star and gamma 1 equals 4 thirds? Well, the total energy will be zero, and it will be on the brink of instability. But the thing is, gamma 1 is always between 4 thirds and 5 thirds. 4 thirds is for 100% radiation pressure. 5 thirds is 100% gas pressure. We found this result in Stellar Physics 2C. So according to Newton, stars are always stable, because gamma 1 will always be a little bit bigger than 4 thirds. There is an exception to this, which is what's called the electron-positron pair instability, in which case something funny happens with the electrons, and gamma-1 drops below 4 thirds. We'll take a look at that in a couple of videos. But apart from that, according to Newtonian gravity, stars are always stable. Well, obviously that can't be true, because exploding stars and collapsing stars have been observed. And also notice, I forgot to mention this earlier, if gamma 1 equals 4 thirds, this exponent is zero, which means that the equilibrium density is independent of the mass of the star, which is another way of saying that the radius and the mass are independent. And in fact, we're going to see in the next slide that if gamma 1 equals 4 thirds, then any radius is in equilibrium. So let's take a look at this radiation dominated situation. As I said, for a 100% radiation dominated star, according to Newtonian gravity, the total energy will be zero, and it will be right on the brink of instability. So what does that mean physically? If we go back to our diagram for binding energy, gamma 1 equals 4 thirds means the total energy is zero, and remember that the energy is the infalling kinetic energy that's been lost. So this piece, which is the gravitational potential energy, is the negative of the infalling kinetic energy right before it stops. And this piece is the amount of that energy that gets dumped into heat. So if the total energy is zero, that means that all this infalling kinetic energy is dumped into thermal energy, and none of it is radiated away. So the star still retains all the energy necessary to be blown up, it's just all contained in thermal energy. All right, but I said gamma one is never actually four thirds, it's always a little bit bigger than 4 thirds, because there's always a little bit of gas pressure. Remember, beta is the fractional gas pressure. Now, recall what the definition of gamma 1 is. It tells you about the partial derivative of the pressure with respect to the density while holding entropy constant, meaning with no heat flow. So physically, what does this mean? If I change the density, so let's say I squeeze the star a little bit, and before heat has time to flow, I ask, how does the pressure respond? And that's what gamma 1 tells you. So it's kind of like a spring constant. But if I contract the star a bit, it will become denser, and so gravity will be a little bit stronger. And so you have to ask, does the pressure increase enough to counteract the increase in gravity? Well, if gamma 1 is greater than 4 thirds, what this means is that if I contract the star, gravity increases but the pressure increases more than gravity, and so the star gets pushed back out to where it was. 
And similarly, if I expand it, gravity decreases, but the pressure decreases even more, and so gravity pulls it back down to where it was initially. If, on the other hand, gamma 1 is exactly 4 thirds, then the increase in gravity will be exactly the same as the increase in pressure, and the star will not go back to where it was, it'll just sit there. Same thing if I expand it. So in the case of gamma 1 is equal to 4 thirds, you can expand and contract the star at no energy cost, and it'll happily sit there at any radius. But that's true for Newtonian gravity. In reality, Newtonian gravity is not correct. General relativity is correct, as far as we know. So in the case of gamma 1 equals 4 thirds, if I contract the star, Newtonian gravity will exactly cancel out the increase in pressure. But actually, the increase in gravitational pull will be a little bit stronger than Newtonian gravity. And so even if that term is very small, you have to take it into consideration. So this is very interesting, because for a radiation-dominated star, the energy and the stability is entirely determined by corrections due to general relativity, even if the stellar structure is entirely Newtonian throughout the star. And that's because the total energy, according to Newton, is exactly zero. And it doesn't matter how small the general relativistic corrections are, a tiny bit is always bigger than zero. So, for radiation-dominated stars, you have to include corrections due to general relativity to see what happens. And when you do this, you find that the criteria for stability is that gamma 1 tilde minus 4 thirds has to be greater than a term that's of order the metric deviation, so 2gm over rc squared. So this left-hand side of the equation will be of order beta, which is very small, and this term is a result of general relativistic corrections. So now our equation for the total energy will be the initial energy we had, plus a small correction in the internal energy, plus corrections due to GR. So these first two terms will be zero for gamma 1 equals 4 thirds, so that's the total Newtonian energy. This delta E internal will be of order beta, and this will be the correction due to GR. And these corrections will be the subject of the next video, where we're going to look at energy and stability in general relativity. So if you'd like to see this, be sure to hit the bell to be notified for the next video. And of course, please consider liking and subscribing.